mid to large sized seven seat SUV is nothing new, but one with a proper full hybrid engine that you don't have to plug in is a great deal rarer. That's what's on offer from Toyota's Highlander. Does any car in this class make more sense than this one? That's what we're here to find out. In a European market with manufacturers struggling to meet ever more stringent CO2 emissions regulations, what volume brand would launch a big, heavy, seven-seat, large-segment SUV? Probably only Toyota, and this is it, the Highlander. Going forward, any large segment SUV of this kind must feature electrification, which in this class usually means a plug-in PHEV powertrain. But sometimes that can compromise the cabin so a third seating row can't be fitted. And usually there are compromises in terms of efficiency because cars of this sort usually cover the kind of motorway miles that the electric range of PHEV won't be able to meet. All of which explains why a self-charging full hybrid petrol powertrain for a car like this might well be the ideal solution if you don't want a diesel. And a full hybrid of this sort is something that few of this Highlander's direct class competitors can offer. Which is why Toyota is finally offering this model line here, launching in early 2021 and perfect for the SUV buyers who'd like a Toyota, require something larger than a RAV4 but don't need the clunky capability of a Land Cruiser. Three previous generations of Highlanders have sold in North American, Japanese, Russian and Australian markets with a heritage going all the way back to the turn of the century. This one though is by far the most sophisticated yet, not only because of its 2.5 litre hybrid engine, but also because of the new era GAK platform it shares with the RAV4 and the Camry Saloon. But is this powertrain and chassis combination really suited to the kind of light off-roading that E-segment SUVs habitually do? Has the full hybrid setup affected the interior packaging? And is this tarmac orientated contender the first really big Toyota 4x4 to feel properly suited to the dynamic demands of a paved surface? All good questions, let's get on with trying to answer them. It's hard to shift the expectation that a big Toyota SUV of this size should have a rumbly diesel engine. This one hasn't, as you'll discover when a press of the start button delivers a little more than a beep, a green ready light, and a few theatrical balletics from the blue needled instrument dials. Uh, that's before you ease away with an EV car's usual rather weird sci-fi soundtrack. which doesn't last for long because with a self-charging hybrid engine of this sort, uh, the fossil fueled petrol power plant cuts in almost immediately. Uh, this one's the same 2.5 litre dual VVT-i dynamic force, four cylinder unit that you'll find in the current RAV4. Here it develops 245 brake horsepower. It's assisted by two electric motors, one on the front axle and one on the rear, with the latter making it possible uh, to have an electrically operable all wheel drive i 4x4 system. These motors are powered by a 1.87 kilowatt hour nickel metal hydride battery pack which can independently power the car for very short periods if you press this EV button between the seats. Powered EV motion isn't the raison d'etre of a self-charging hybrid engine though. Power plants like this one are designed for low speed and stop start urban driving conditions where battery power is used only in short frequent bursts and constantly replenished with harvested braking and deceleration energy. If those aren't the kinds of driving conditions that'll typify this Highlander's use, then you're probably better off choosing a diesel in this segment instead. But if your driving life can suit the engineering in play here, then it's almost a win-win scenario, diesel-like efficiency without diesel-like tax downsides. We say almost, you can't have everything, and everything would include the kind of prodigious mid-range torque and pulling power that you would get from a black pump fueled SUV, but you don't get here. This Highlander's 239 newton meter torque figure means that you're not getting much more than half the pulling power that you could expect from a comparably priced and powered diesel model in this segment. Uh, you would have expected Toyota to have done a bit better than that, 
Uh, this model's two most direct segment rivals, the HEV full hybrid versions of the Kia Sorento and the Hyundai Santa Fe, well, they both managed to generate 265 newton meters of torque from an engine only 1.6 liters in size. Both those cars have a more responsive auto gearbox than this one too, uh, using proper dual clutch cogs rather than the CVT rubber belt system that Toyota seems continually wedded to with its arbitrarily placed virtual gear ratios which can be accessed via steering wheel paddles that you'll almost certainly never use. Uh, even when you're accelerating really quite gently, the gearbox sends the revs soaring without uh, very much accompaniment in terms of rapid forward motion. Uh, if you push your right foot right down hard, uh, much the same thing happens, although with the added bonus of a straining engine note. Now initially this is very frustrating until you realize that a different kind of driving style is required here. You don't make a hybrid engine go quickly by ramming your foot down to the floor but by backing off the throttle between ratios in the way that lets the revs drop and the engine bite into the torque curve. Once you understand that, things improve and they get better still once you realize that the initially rather dead feel that you get when you're pushing on the accelerator can be mitigated by fiddling with the drive mode options available to you via this rocker switch between the seats here. Uh, these include a sport setting as well as the ordinary normal and eco modes. As you expect, all of these tweak the steering and the throttle feel along with gear change timings too, plus you can shift the auto gear lever into a plus and minus zone to take control of the virtual ratios yourself. With the sport mode activated, the 2.5 litre VBTi engine gathers itself together with a bit more enthusiasm and the instrument binnacle's central screen, uh, which displays with white or blue themes in other modes, gains a lower red frame. You can't raise your hopes too high in this regard though, uh, the stats say that 62 miles an hour from rest occupies 8.3 seconds, but after the decent electrical kick you get from standstill, it doesn't feel that fast and the top speed is limited to a modest 111 miles an hour. More significantly, given the kind of car this is, you'll be limited to a two-ton brake to towing capacity. Uh, a comparable diesel model, well that would be able to tow about half a ton more than that. To be fair though, this Highlanders figure is 350 kilos higher than is managed by those two Kia and Hyundai hybrid models we just mentioned. Uh, they manage only 1,650 kilos, and that's the same as you get from an all-wheel drive Toyota RAV4. What else? Uh, well, the Highlander is surprisingly easy to manoeuvre about, well, for something almost five metres long and nearly two metres wide anyway. Uh, the lofty driving position helps here, and although you can't really see the front corners of the car, the bonnet slope gives you a good idea of where they are. Uh, out of town, thanks to the modern GAK platform, there's less of a roly-poly channel ferry feel to the cornering demeanor uh, than there is to the Land Cruiser. Uh, the steering has also a bit more feedback, uh, but that's not really saying very much. And by class standards, uh, this is about as unengaging as it gets. And that will probably bother most likely Highlander folk, not one jot. These people will instead revel in the superb refinement. All you can really hear as a cruise is wind and tyre noise and the comfort orientated suspension which eases you over speed humps and terrible tarmac tears. Ride quality is helped too by a clever ride control with torque demand system and this controls drive torque to the front wheels to reduce vehicle pitch that's caused through undulations in the road surface while also reducing the bonnet lift which would usually occur under hard acceleration. We usually finish any review of a large SUV with a quick summary of off-road ability. It's very quick in most cases. Uh, soft roading crossovers of this kind aren't, of course, intended for the Serengeti. Uh, this one isn't either. Uh, choose a Land Cruiser if you want that. Although it does at least sit about seven millimeters higher than a RAV4, so there's a bit more wading depth capability. 400 millimeters, in fact. So if you live out in the sticks, you'll be a bit better placed for those winter floods. Actually, on ground that's fairly even, the all-wheel drive eye system in play here performs reasonably, uh, partly because when necessary, it's able to direct more torque to the rear wheels than many mechanical 4x4 systems deliver. Uh, that really helps when you're pulling away on loose, slippery surfaces, at which point the all-wheel drive eye system automatically distributes torque according to the tractional needs at each axle, uh, with a front-to-rear split that can vary from 100% at the front and zero at the back 
uh, up to 20% front and 80% rear depending on conditions. Equally important is the inclusion of an automatic limited slip differential control. Our Toyota calls it a trail mode and it's selected via this button between the seats here. It deals with the issue that afflicts some less capable four-wheel drive crossovers, uh, cars that are on the risk of getting stranded if the driven wheel loses contact with the ground on very uneven terrain. Should this happen, when trail mode is activated, the free rotating wheel will be braked while drive torque is directed to the grounded wheel. At the same time, throttle control and the transmission shift pattern will be adapted to help the driver keep the vehicle moving. Uh, that's all very reassuring uh, should you end up with this Toyota somewhere where you really shouldn't have ventured in the first place. Uh, that's not a wise policy because the key off-road stats are distinctly modest. A maximum approach angle of 18.1 degrees, a maximum breakover angle of 16.7 degrees and uh, the maximum departure angle is 22.7 degrees. But you'll slither hairily down that kind of slope because this car doesn't get any kind of hill descent control system. Probably more relevant to likely buyers is the news that Toyota offers a far wider range of camera-driven driving safety features on its cars these days, and that's courtesy of the standard Safety Sense package. Uh, the pre-collision autonomous braking system, that's one of those that works at night um, when the majority of accidents actually happen, and it can specifically spot errant cyclists as well as other vehicles and the more usual obstacles. Plus, there's intelligent adaptive cruise control for the kind of highway environment where this car feels quite at home as both engine and electrification combine for efficient progress. At which point you might be excused a smug smile of satisfaction as you cruise alongside the smoky diesel-powered large SUVs that you could have bought for much the same sort of money. Here perhaps is a better way to go, or at least a better way as Toyota sees it. We understand their perspective, uh, you may not. Either way, there's absolutely no doubt that this Highlander is a welcome alternative to the usual class suspects. There is something of a Land Cruiser look here, but also the feel of the kind of big American SUV that this Highland is trying to be. Under the skin, its car-like monocoque construction is a cut above lumbering stateside 4x4s, but it certainly has that kind of imposing, although not especially memorable, pavement presence. Especially here at the front, where this big, bluff, trapezoidally shaped grille dominates. Its uh, Toyota badged chrome strip is almost an afterthought. Remove that and this could be an SUV from just about any volume brand you might care to name. Corner cutouts house the tiny fog lights. There's a silvered lower apron strip that's presumably a half-hearted attempt at something resembling a skid plate and a vast clamshell bonnet. It's just the sort of thing that's perfect for the parking lot at Walmart. You will need a pretty big space though. This Highlander measures in at only a fraction under five meters in length. In Toyota Motor Corporation seven seat SUV terms, uh, there's a compromise here between the boxy garden shed shape of the Land Cruiser and the more swept back silhouette of the Lexus RXL. Nods to lifestyle looks include this sturdy, forward-leaning lower body, the rear-sloping, tapering cabin with its blacked-out pillars, privacy glass and chrome roof rails. Uh, widely flared rear arches house huge 20-inch wheels, which on this top premium model are of the dark grey machined variety. At the rear, you get a feel for this car's substantial width, 1930 millimetres, and its height, 1755 mils. The tail section is otherwise characterised by these sharp, slim light clusters and a rather curious lower bumper arrangement. Uh, silver finishing is uh, again suggestive of the kind of proper protective skid plate this car lacks with angled reflectors at each corner. As usual, of course, what's more important is what you can't see, the GAK monocot chassis we referenced earlier on. Now this borrows from the Toyota TNGA global architecture the brand uses these days, and that means it's a world away from the clunky body on frame underpinnings of a Land Cruiser. Stepping up into the driver's seat has something of the feel you'll get with that classic global Toyota SUV though. 
as does the feel you'll get from the way that you're commandingly positioned behind the wheel. Uh, some of that's down not only to the height of the perch, but the solid, durable and rather old school cabin feel. The instrument panel has a solid central element that houses the multimedia display and flows across the full width of the dashboard and it's framed by smooth soft touch padding, visually supported by this wide square central console. In terms of design and materials, there's an awful lot going on here. Uh, just check out, for example, all the faux stitched leather, the faux chrome, uh, the faux carbon fibre and various different strakes and angles in front of the front seat passenger. Otherwise, there's nothing particularly trendy in terms of design, no digital instrument binnacle screen or silly touch sensitive controls and a rather refreshing preference for buttons. We've counted 16 of them rather than screen menu options. And you don't even get the kind of big central multimedia display which is currently in vogue. Uh, ignore the physical switch gear on the side and you realize that this one is just eight inches in size, uh, which is surprising because US versions of this car get a 12.3 inch widescreen. It's about time Toyota updated this Touch 2 monitor properly, not only in terms of size, but also in terms of graphics and response times. All the brands done in recent times is to add Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone integration to it. As usual with a Touch 2 setup, you get destination, audio, phone, apps and info sections. Destination gives you full navigation. Audio connects you into an excellent standard 11 speaker JBL audio system. Apps connects you to an online e-store and info gives you efficiency readouts and the brand's usual excellent energy monitor showing you at any given time the status of the hybrid drive system. Uh, the central screen is also your portal for either a rear view camera or with this top spec variant, a panoramic view monitor. Anything you can't find here will probably feature somewhere in the instrument binnacle that you view through this chunky heated three spoke wheel. It's fitted out with paddle shifters that you'll probably never use. One of the defiantly analog blue needle dials as usual on a Toyota hybrid is a power meter with charge, eco and power sections. And between the gauges with time and speed limit readouts above and temperature, gear and odometer info below sits a 7 inch TFT multi information screen which you control via these buttons on the left hand steering wheel spoke. Uh, this display has various sections, an efficiency menu with MPG, eco score and digital speedo options, a driving assistance graphic with a compass, uh, a smaller version of the interactive energy monitor graphic plus options to look at tyre pressures, uh, the torque distribution of the all-wheel drive setup and the status of the various safety systems. What else? Well, the soft, wide, leather upholstered, heated and power adjustable seats, also ventilated on this top variant, uh, the kind of chairs you'd want for a cruise through the Nevada desert or more likely through the next snowy snap. Uh, the big buttons could be operated with a gloved hand and although materials quality isn't a match for what you get from premium brands or even from some volume makers, it all feels built to last and it's better assembled than is often the case in this segment where trendy cabins which would start rattling and shaking at speed over a gravel rutted road are more usually the norm. There are some nice touches too. A head-up display is becoming de rigueur on cars in this class these days, but it's quite unusual though to find as here a rear view mirror that doubles as a rear view camera with a feed from a roof camera so you can see uh, behind even if the back of the car is loaded up with luggage or tall people. This is nice too, this sliding top for the storage box between the seats. It eases back to reveal a wireless phone charger, but also an ugly white and yellow sticker. Uh, the charger panel lifts to reveal a deep stowage area, which has a sliding lift out panel, but which lacks connectivity points. Those are found in this area at the bottom of the center stack. You get two 2.1 amp points, a USB A port and a 12 volt socket. Just above is a mid-level storage cubby, plus you get another one at mid-level ahead of the front seat passenger, uh, just above that big glove box. The door bins, which have bottle holders, aren't very big though, and Toyota has forgotten to include ticket clips in the sun visors and an overhead sunglasses compartment. 
What else? Uh, well, the steering wheel could do with more rearward adjustment, but at least all round visibility is good. And that's not only due to this lofty driving position, but also the big side windows and the relatively thin screen pillars. Uh, those at the front house neat little JBL speakers. Obviously, manoeuvring a car of this size in a tight car park isn't for the faint hearted, but you get a rear view camera and all round parking sensors fitted out with automatic braking and that'll stop the car if you're just about to hit something low that you haven't seen. Plus this top variant gets a surround view panoramic camera. Time to take a look in the second row where the big squashy seats can trundle forwards and backwards over a 180 millimeter range when you pull on these low corner catches. So unless you're having to compromise your position for the sake of those behind, legroom shouldn't be in short supply. A pull on the shoulder catches reclines the backrest too. If you stretch to this top XL premium spec, then there's the airy feel that's delivered by this big panoramic glass and that doesn't uh, compromise headroom that being as generous as you'd expect from the boxy shape. Nice touches include side window blinds, separate rear climate controls, and on this top variant, heated up holstery. Uh, there's usual fold down armrest with cup holders, reading lights and side vents feature overhead. You get a couple of 2.1 amp connectivity ports. Uh, there are coat hooks in the grab handles, big door bins with bottle holders and deep door pull recesses surrounded by premium style trim and seat back pockets. Everything you'd want really. Now cars like this usually require a level of athleticism in reaching their third seating row, which would typically be beyond granny on her Sunday afternoon trip to the garden centre. But this one's not too bad. You can enter from either side, but there is a wider entrance aperture on the driver's side, and that's accessed after a pull on this seat base catch, which allows you to push the bench forward. Once here in the very back, you'll be thankful for the body shape's boxy dimensions. Headroom's fine, even for quite tall adults. Predictably though, knee and legroom isn't, unless you have a particularly accommodating set of passengers who are set ahead of you, uh, who are prepared to move their chairs right forward. So as usual in a seven seat SUV, uh, this third row is really most appropriate for those of school age. Uh, occupants can't be too young though, uh, and that's because disappointingly, Toyota has neglected to fit Isofix child seat fastenings back here. Uh, they are only provided on the outer seats of the second row. Rival brand models make exactly the same error, but that doesn't make this uh, feature's omission uh, any less disappointing. In class context, there's about the same amount of legroom back here as you get in a Land Rover Discovery, and a bit more than is provided by most of the other key class protagonists. Uh, the seat backs recline with a pull on their shoulder catches, and you also get overhead vents, uh, twin cup holders, an overhead light, and uh, also reasonably sized side windows to stop you from getting too claustrophobic. Right, let's finish with a look at the boot, and that's accessed via this power-operated tailgate. Although it only gets this uh, hands-free kick sensor if you stretch up to top spec trim level. Uh, the hatch creaks open at arthritic speed to reveal a 268 litre space when all three seating rows are in place, or 332 litres if you load up to the roof. You can improve that quite a bit though by altering the angle of the third row seat backs. There's a high loading lip and very little extra space beneath the boot floor, although the right hand edge of it lifts up for small items and the tonneau cover will fit under here. Uh, two silver tie down points are provided too and appropriately for an SUV you get a temporary spare wheel. Will the hybrid drive system compromise luggage capacity compared to the class norm though once you start folding seats? Well not really, uh, most of the time of course you're going to be using this car with these third row pews folded into the floor which gives you a 579 litre boot with the middle bench slid to its rearmost point or 658 litres if the bench is in its mid position. It's 865 litres if you load up to the roof. Fold the centre row down as well, the seat back splits 60-40 and you can increase capacity to 1,177 litres or 1,909 if you load up to the roof.
From launch, Toyota was asking just over £50,000 for the most affordable XL version of this Highlander, with the plusher XL Premium variant costing just over £52,500. For our market, this car comes with the high standard of spec that the brand is convinced that UK customers will want, and it's offered only with Toyota's 2.5-litre VVTi full hybrid engine. Predictably, there's no chance of the UK being offered the large conventional petrol power plants which are available to Highlander customers in other global markets. In explaining the value proposition here, let's start by positioning this car in Toyota's lineup for you. Uh, a comparably equipped Excel Spec RAV4 with the same engine and the same all-wheel drive system that's being used here costs around £13,000 less, so you've really got to want this Highlander's extra space and third seating row. Uh, you could even have a RAV4 plug-in for around £4,500 less than this Highlander. And with that car, you'll enjoy a 46-mile EV driving range rather than one that runs out after, well, a mile or so. Uh, there won't be many Highlander customers who are cross-shopping with a Toyota Land Cruiser, though. But since that model is the brand's only other large SUV, uh, we will tell you that a base active spec, long wheelbase, seven-seat Land Cruiser costs around £45,000, while a more comparably specced uh, Invincible trimmed one, well, that would cost from just over £57,000. It's also worth mentioning this car's Toyota Motor Corporation cousin, the Lexus RXL. That's also a seven-seater, and it's also a full hybrid, although the electrified engine in that case is a V6 rather than a four, and it puts out much more power, 308 horsepower. Although, of course, that means running costs are higher too. Uh, the Lexus costs around £4,000 more than a base Highlander, and because of its swept-back styling, it can't offer the same kind of third-row seat room or boot space as this Toyota. What about more direct rivals for this Highlander from other brands? Well, the two most comparable alternatives, uh, they come from South Korea, that's the Kia Sorento and the Hyundai Santa Fe. Uh, they're the only other two large E-segment seven-seat SUVs which offer a self-charging full hybrid engine. Now, both those models use the same 1.6-litre TGDI petrol HEV power plant, and that's a 226 HP unit, and it offers less ultimate power than a Highlander, but slightly more torque, 265 newton meters of it. Uh, the cheaper versions of both those HEV models cost in the 39 to 40,000 pound bracket, with the very top spec variants, though, up around 46 and 47,000 pounds. Either way, there's quite a saving over this Toyota and the efficiency returns, well, they're very similar to what you'll get in a Highlander. Hyundai and Kia, though, uh, they are relatively new to this technology. I mean, Toyota has been developing this for decades. Perhaps you'll feel able to pay a premium for that kind of experience. There aren't really any other direct rivals. Uh, the only other proper hybrid E-segment SUV is the plug-in version of the Seat Turaco, and that doesn't have seven seats, and it won't save you uh, very much over this Toyota. Uh, Land Rover's Discovery, that now has a mild hybrid engine, but that's a diesel, and it's not really a proper hybrid in that it can never run independently on battery power, so running costs, of course, will be much higher than for this Highlander. Uh, for reference, though, so, uh, a comparably uh, performing Land Rover Discovery 3 litre 249 horsepower model costs in the 54 to 56,000 pound bracket. The other seven seat E segment SUVs you might consider all use the conventional non electrified diesel engines that a typical Highlander customer will rather disparage. Uh, the ordinary Seat Taraco, the Skoda Kodiak, and the Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace, they all share basically the same engineering. And uh, the nearest comparable engine, which is fitted to all three, is the VW Group's. 2 litre TDI 200 PS unit, which with a DSG automatic transmission and four wheel drive will probably cost you somewhere in the 40 to 45,000 pound bracket with all three of those models. Uh, the variance depends on trim. In theory, you might also consider a seven seat diesel powered segment contenders like the DS7 Crossback or the Sangyong Rexton. Uh, they respectively come in just above or just below the 40,000 pound price point. Or also possibly a Peugeot 5008, that is well under £40,000, but it lacks four-wheel drive. All of the models we just mentioned offer more cramped third-row quarters than the Highlander, though. Uh, you'll need a Discovery for more comparable third-seating row space. 
A discovery, by the way, would cost you very much the same as this Toyota on a typical finance deal uh, at the time of this test in spring 2021 for a Highlander purchased on PCP Finance with a 10% deposit over 36 months with 10,000 miles. Customers were looking at an outlay of around £774 a month, uh, which, by the way, is also about the same as you'll pay for a Volvo XC90 with mild hybrid petrol and diesel power. Now, that Swedish contender is a large segment seven-seat SUV from the premium class above, and that's priced at around the 55 to 56,000 pound price point. That's the same kind of money as you'll need for another seven-seat SUV, which might be on a typical Highlander customer's radar, a mild hybrid diesel Audi Q7, although the Audi costs a bit more on finance. Uh, neither an XC90 or a Q7 offer appreciably more cabin space than a Highlander. And because both lack the full hybrid powertrain at that price point, both will cost considerably more than this Japanese SUV to run and tax. If, having considered all that, you conclude that it is this Toyota that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous the brand has been with that standard specification. Well, you shouldn't be disappointed. Uh, the company isn't messing around with any kind of entry-level trim option, so the range kicks straight off uh, with the generously appointed XL spec model that we mentioned earlier on, and that's identifiable by the five triple-spoke design of its big 20-inch alloy wheels. You get projector LED headlamps with cleaners and LED illumination for the front fog lamps and for the tail lights. Plus there's a power operated tailgate, there's rear privacy glass, chrome roof rails, smart entry keyless entry, auto headlamps and wipers, uh, puddle lights and an alarm too. And there's intelligent all round parking sensors uh, which feature a clearance sonar and auto brake system and that'll stop the car being manoeuvred into objects that you might not have seen, uh, a low wall for example. Uh, other driving features include intelligent adaptive cruise control and a drive mode select driving mode system. Inside, there's black leather upholstery and seats that are heated and power adjustable at the front with memory settings for the driver. The triple zone air conditioning system, uh, that features pollen and clean air filters. Plus, uh, there are separate second row controls. And the instrument binnacle has a seven inch color TFT central display. Uh, Highlander branded scuff plates and carbon effect door trim give a premium feel. And there's a heated steering wheel, uh, a wireless smartphone charging mat, an auto dimming rear view mirror, and also blue ambient lighting for the door panels, for the fascia, and for the dashboard's open storage tray. Media stuff is taken care of by our Toyota Touch 2 with Go 8-inch touchscreen, which incorporates navigation, a DAB tuner, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone integration, various hybrid drive information menus, and limited voice recognition. As with all new Toyotas, there's also the MyT connectivity app, which will allow you to remotely engage with your Highlander, plus it includes a hybrid coaching section, which will help you to optimize your EV driving. Want to go further? Then you'll need to stretch to the plusher XL Premium variant that we have here. And that's identified by, by its dark grey machine-faced 10-spoke 20-inch alloy wheels. At this level in the range, Toyota adds in a panoramic view monitor, a head-up display and a digital rear view mirror, which functions as a rearward camera. Uh, there's also heated second row outer seats and a kick activation function for the powered tailgate. What about options? Well, your dealer will offer you the essential protection pack, which includes a boot liner and a chrome bumper protection plate, uh, both of which can be ordered separately. Uh, there is also a boot mat and a horizontal cargo net. You can also order side steps and, of course, there's a tow bar, uh, either the fixed or detachable kind. Plus, you can add the roof cross rails, which will allow you to add in carriers for roof boxes, uh, skis, snowboards and bikes. If you're not happy with the various metallic paint colours, uh, we have Dacuma Grey here. There are also three extra-cost pearlescent paint shades. Uh, they are Moondust, Tokyo Red and White Pearl. 
Enough with options. What about safety? Well, there's the usual Toyota Safety Sense Pack and that bundles together various key radar-driven safety elements. Uh, the most significant of those is autonomous braking. Now, Toyota calls its setup a pre-collision system and it has updated it to specifically allow for pedestrian and cyclist detection. Um, now, as you drive, the pre-collision system scans the road ahead uh, looking for potential collision hazards, static or or vehicular ones at any speed and pedestrians at speeds of up to 50 miles an hour. If the setup thinks you might be in danger of hitting something, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or perhaps you aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. The Toyota Safety Sense package also includes a road sign assist feature which pictures road signs as you pass them and displays them on the instrument display. And there's lane departure alert with steering control and that monitors lane markings on the road surface and it will alert you if your vehicle starts to deviate from its lane without the turn indicators being used. Uh, at the same time it uses integrated lane trace assist to gently apply steering input to help to centre you back in your lane. Uh, this system also recognises curbs, grass or earth at the side of the road too, so you'll be warned and steered to safety if you veer towards the pavement or the hedge. There's more too. The pack includes emergency steering assist to help quicken the steering during an evasive manoeuvre, an adaptive high beam system which automatically dips your headlamps for you at night, and as I mentioned earlier on, uh, there's also adaptive cruise control. Now that will automatically slow or speed the car at highway speeds to suit surrounding traffic, and it incorporates curve speed reduction, and that slows the vehicle if you enter a bend too fast with cruise engaged. Uh, finally, in terms of safety sense pack features, there's also intersection turn assist, and that helps to avoid the common risk of colliding with another vehicle or a pedestrian when you're making a turn at an intersection. Now here, if the system detects an oncoming pedestrian crossing the carriageway that the vehicle is just about to turn into, or if there is a risk of the vehicle moving across the path of oncoming traffic, it will sound an alert, and if the driver fails to respond, it will apply automatic emergency braking. Uh, the function operates at speeds between 6 and 15 miles an hour. Other key safety tech we need to mention includes a blind spot monitor, which stops you from dangerously pulling out in front of another vehicle, and rear cross traffic alert, which warns you of oncoming traffic when you're reversing out of a space, and which can, if necessary, use automatic braking to stop the car until the oncoming vehicle has passed. Uh, there is also trailer sway control. Now here, when crosswinds, uh, variations in the road surface, or driver steering inputs provoke trailer sway, uh, braking and engine output control will automatically be introduced to suppress the movement before it becomes uncontrollable. As for airbags, well, seven of those are provided, uh, twin front side and curtain bags, plus a driver's knee bag. If they ever activate in an accident, an integrated e-call feature will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact GPS location. Uh, Isofix charge seat mountings, they are provided for the two outer second row seat positions, although uh, we are a bit disappointed to find that there are no Isofix fastenings in the third row. Uh, after all, that might be where you'd like to fit a charge seat. As for the basic electronic stuff, well, there's ABS braking uh, with electronic brake force distribution. That makes it rather more effective. Uh, that's along with a feature which will flash the brake lights in emergency stops, and that's to warn following motorists. Plus, of course, a vehicle stability control system is also included. Uh, there is no downhill assist control system like you do get on the Land Cruiser or on the Hilux. Uh, there's just the usual active traction control and hill start assist control systems. Toyota has had a very long run of virtually having the market to itself when it comes to self-charging full hybrid models, cars that can run independently on full battery power, unlike mild hybrid models, but which don't have to carry around the weight, the complexity and the price premium of a PHEV plug-in hybrid. In recent years, though, uh, the big Korean brands have noticed the appeal of this sort of engineering, uh, with the result that what Toyota might have 
hoped would be a unique selling point here uh, has instead been replicated by two close rivals, namely 1.6 litre TGDI HEV versions of the Kia Sorento and the Hyundai Santa Fe. Let's get to the figures. Uh, the WLTP stats state that the Highlander returns bests of 39.2 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 160 grams per kilometre of CO2. Entry level 1.6 litre TGDI HEV versions of the Sorento and of the Santa Fe can both better that by a bit, but only because they run on smaller wheels with larger rims closer to the size of the big 20 inches fitted to this Toyota, you'd probably find that both the Kia and the Hyundai deliver you very similar returns to those you get from the Highlander. Whichever of these three protagonists you favour, you're going to be paying a lot less tax than would be the case with a more conventionally engined uh, rival in this segment. Uh, the Toyota's first year vehicle excise duty payment, that'll be £545. The Highlander XL has a benefit in kind rating of 36%. It's 35% for this plusher XL premium variant. Uh, for the XL, that means that the 40% taxpayers first year BIK tax exposure will be £7,406. To give you some class perspective, uh, let's tell you that this is around £1,600 less than you'd have to find for a Volvo XC90 B6 petrol mild hybrid model. Over three years, the Volvo will cost you nearly £5,000 more in BIK payments. A PHEV plug-in hybrid model in this class would do better, of course. Uh, if you are tempted to stretch to PHEV plug-in hybrid technology for your big family SUV to get a far longer electric-only driving range capability, then you've either got to lose the versatility of having a third seating row and get something like a Toyota RAV4 plug-in, or pay 15 to 20,000 pounds more for plug-in versions of cars like the Volvo XC90 or the Audi Q7. You might find neither of these alternative options especially tempting, especially as with a plug-in SUV, uh, as soon as you venture onto a motorway and quickly exhaust the battery's range, uh, you'll effectively be driving a heavy, thirsty, petrol-powered SUV, and there's nothing particularly efficient about that. Toyota could easily offer a plug-in version of this car. It rides on the same platform as a RAV4 plug-in after all, but for the time being, self-charging hybrid tech, uh, the brand thinks, offers a more real-world approach to the generation of cleaner emissions. Although, of course, uh, during much of your urban motoring with the Highlander, say when you're inching along in traffic with the engine seamlessly disabled, uh, the EV mode activated, and battery power in motion, you won't be emitting any emissions at all. You can monitor the hybrid system's cleverness on the energy monitor display that you'll find on the center console screen. Uh, the same display also provides graphical trip information and history screens so that you can gauge your ongoing success in energy regeneration and fuel economy. At higher speeds, you'll need to bear in mind that the quoted fuel figures are even more heavily dependent than usual on the driver assuming a significant degree of restraint. Certainly to get anywhere near to even the 35 mpg mark in day-to-day -day use with this Toyota, you'll have to keep the car locked into the provided eco mode. Uh, that moderates throttle response and engine power output while also tweaking the climate control system. Plus, you'll also need to keep a very careful eye on the hybrid system indicator, which replaces the usual rev counter on the dash, uh, and make sure that the needle stays as often as possible in either of the blue charge or green eco zones. Now, while Kia and Hyundai are still on the nursery slopes in their understanding of self-charging hybrid engineering, Toyota has already reached the fourth generation of its hybrid synergy drive system. Although its 1.87 kilowatt hour battery, which is secreted under the second row seat, uh, harvesting regenerated battery energy as volts, still uses old tech nickel metal hydride cells. In other respects, though, this dynamic force engine is pretty sophisticated. It adopts the efficient Atkinson cycle using a particularly long stroke and operating at a high compression ratio. As the Korean makers would have discovered when they're taking this engine apart and pouring over it, friction losses have been minimized. Uh, there's a full variable oil pump for particularly efficient engine oil pressure management. And uh, this unit also achieves an impressively high peak thermal efficiency rating of 41%.
There's not much of an efficiency downside with the all-wheel drive i 4x4 system in use here either. That's because it's electrically operated so it can be more compact and lighter in weight than the mechanical 4x4 setups that rival SUVs use. All of this technology might make you worry about this Highlander hybrid model's reliability, but the Prius-derived engineering uh, that's in use here scores very highly in almost every customer satisfaction survey going, and all models are covered by a five-year, 100,000-mile warranty. Uh, it's not quite a match for Kia's seven-year deal, but it's a notable improvement on the limiting three-year, 60,000-mile packages that you'll get from brands like Skoda, Seat and Volkswagen in this segment. Unlike earlier Toyota hybrid models, there's no extended warranty for the hybrid components. Um, early Priuses were covered for up to eight years. However, for an additional outlay, you can guarantee the petrol electric underpinnings for up to 11 years on an unlimited mileage deal. As standard, Highlander buyers get five years of pan-European roadside assistance, uh, a three-year paint warranty, and also 12 years of anti-perforation cover. As for looking after your car, well, routine maintenance, uh, that's needed every 10,000 miles or 12 months, depending on which comes around first. Uh, that might be a little frustrating if you are a higher mileage driver. There's a dedicated My Toyota website that allows you to book a service online, and Toyota has a fixed price servicing plan, so you'll know in advance exactly how much any work is going to cost you before you check into a dealer. You could also take advantage of the optional prepaid servicing plan uh, that the dealer will offer you at point of purchase. This enables Highlander owners to cover the cost of routine maintenance with monthly or one-off payments in advance. However you go about paying for your maintenance on a Highlander Hybrid, it shouldn't cost you a huge amount. After all, there's no starter motor or alternator to go wrong, uh, there are no drive belts to break, there's a maintenance free timing chain, uh, there's no particulate filter to get clogged up with diesel fumes, and of course, thanks to the CVT Auto Gearbox, there's no clutch either. Uh, the hybrid setup has a good record for minimizing tire wear, and its battery will last the life of the car. Plus, the regenerative braking setup helps to extend the life of the brake pads. Uh, over 60,000 miles of driving, the front pads should only need replacing once, and the rear pads and all the discs will probably last the full distance. What else might you need to know? Uh, residual values, well, they'll be very strong. A comparable RAV4 retains around 57% of its new price after three years and 60,000 miles, and we wouldn't expect a Highlander to fare much differently. That's premium brand territory. On to insurance, uh, rated a group 40p for both variants. Mm -hmm. We can see why you might be attracted to a Highlander. Prior to its arrival, if you didn't want smoky diesel fuel in the large seven-seat SUV segment, your only choices were either mild hybrid petrol engines, only marginally more efficient than their conventional counterparts, or pricey plug-in hybrid models, which give you extra weight and all the hassle of plugging in. We reckon that this Highlander's self-charging full hybrid powertrain offers an appealing compromise between those two extremes. For too long, Toyota's SUV range was limited to the RAV4 and the Land Cruiser. The Highlander sits roughly between those two cars and with the lower end of the Japanese maker's crossover lineup also developed with the Yaris Cross and the CHR and a full electric BZ model to come, the brand now looks properly placed in the SUV market. This car is not exciting, but there are loads of sensible reasons why you might want one. Diesel-like fuel returns and emissions without diesel-like tax and running cost drawbacks. An interior unaffected by battery placement, unlike many rival PHEV crossovers. And the fact that superb refinement and strong equipment levels also come included. We still wish the Highlander was slightly more affordable and a bit more engaging to drive, but we would understand completely if you wanted one. There really is nothing quite like it in segment, and as selling points go, that's a pretty good place to start. <laughs>